My name is Marietje Schaak. I'm a member of the European Parliament with the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe uh, from the Netherlands, representing the 66 political party. And besides focusing on foreign affairs, so a little bit uh, focused on the news of Gaddafi's dead as, death as well, uh, and international trade issues, uh, I work a lot on Europe's digital agenda and looking at the improvements that can be made, the barriers that can be taken down uh, to see whether we can do better for our citizens and for our competitive position in the world. And today we're going to talk about open data, which is one of those subjects where uh, I think a lot of opportunity uh, still remains to be taken. Um, transparency and participation are essential in any democratic system, in democratic government. And we see that the internet has been a driving force to enable the sharing of information on a vast scale, which has led to the widespread expectation of transparent and open governments. And we can answer for ourselves whether we think that this expectation is met in reality. Uh, I would say it isn't. Open data makes it possible to uh, hold governments more accountable and to also include people in policy making processes and in decision making under the banner of we gov, we govern together. Much of the information that is created in public institutions is financed by taxpayers' money anyway. And this includes information about, for example, the weather, traffic, the economy, education, and also culture. And society uh, should be able to access this public sector information, which citizens and businesses can then reuse uh, in useful ways. And we should try to look for opportunities to enable this sharing and this opening of data more than we currently see. The ability to reuse government information leads to more active participation by citizens in policy making and in uh, public discussions, because people would be able to build applications around public sector information. New insights to old problems can be uh, achieved when databases are combined and analyzed in ways that governments may not have thought of or may not have been able to. Businesses also create uh, and add value to government data by providing or uh, developing useful tools. Overall, it's been estimated by some that the opening up of the European public sector information uh, may lead to around 140 billion euros in economic activity. Uh, figures vary, but at least the expectations of the economic uh, benefits of open data are significant. I recently worked on an opinion uh, on e-government for the Committee on Culture and Education in this parliament. And in this piece, uh, we highlighted that the uh, extension of the European Public Sector Information Directive should also include cultural and educational sectors. Because much of the information created by schools and for schools or universities is publicly funded, but is still uh, very much unavailable uh, to the public. And the same goes for information created in publicly funded libraries, museums, and archives. And we all know the example of Europeana, which will be uh, discussed today. But uh, the goal today is to look at some best practices, some exciting examples, and to have a discussion about what we might uh, aspire to in the future. Our program is ambitious. I'm very, very happy with a great uh, uh, amount and also wonderful uh, div diverse set of speakers. I'm very happy that you were uh, willing to come to the European Parliament. Besides all of you, uh, there will be people watching through the live stream and the video that will be made of this event. Um, we've divided the afternoon in two panels. And um, uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce each speaker before they speak so that it's fresh to your memory. And I want to make sure that we also have time for discussion. Uh, so we'll do that after each panel. And there's also a movie in the middle. So we have a full but exciting program. and look forward to the discussions with you. Uh, I would li now like to give the floor to um, Nigel Shadbold, who is a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Southampton. And he's also the head of the Web and Internet Science Group. He's a director of the Web Science Trust and of the Web Foundation. Both organizations have a common commitment to advance our understanding of the web and promote the web's positive impact on society. And in June of 2009, together with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, he was appointed an information advisor by the Prime Minister to help transform public access to government information. So um, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. 
transmit or there we go okay so uh, people who have heard me talk before know I, I just can't do it without slides for some bizarre reason so bear with me these are and I never trust the local uh, technology but uh, it looks fine here okay um, I'm going to tell you briefly about 15 minutes about the UK experience here uh, what we've learned uh, what I'd like to kind of impress on people taking this fantastic, uh, powerful new idea forward. Uh, currently, I, I sit on the UK Public Sector Transparency Board. Um, previously, we advised the previous government on, uh, on setting up uh, Tim and I, data.gov.uk. Um, and it's the sign of a good idea that it survives contact with an election. Okay? So this was taken forward, expanded by the coalition government. And uh, uh, we are uh, very much on a, on a continuing journey. The, uh, the principles we set up for ourselves was to, when we were originally commissioned to do this work in 2009, was set up a, a single portal. But there were other things around it that aren't to do with the technology at all. The public data principles that I'll talk about, that none of this works unless you can provide a continuous flow of data sets, that uh, the key is to use open standards when you publish this stuff, that the premise is if you provide data, then applications will follow. And we'll see examples of that today. And crucially, that you provide a license that is truly open and not your approximation of what you think might be open uh, with a few restrictions here or there. Um, and try, of course, and persuade people who have typically been used to saying no to presume to say yes when they publish their data. And perhaps most importantly, and uh, I'll, I'm afraid I have to leave a five o'clock prompt to get on the plane to go to Warsaw to the Open Government Data Camp, because a key part of this is building the ecosystem of people, developers, SMEs, enthusiasts and activists who can make this live. Now, it can sound great, it can sound great, uh, but it wasn't always this easy. Um, let me show you this picture. I'm going to get a prompt. Tatty copy of our postcode paper. We, uh, in late 2009, assembled in the Guardian newspaper in London and imagined what it would be like if our data was free. And in two days, we had a bunch of uh, enthusiasts build the postcode paper. This is a postcode in London, and inside was print was your neighbourhood crime statistics and your allotments and your timetable for public transport and. Uh, all sorts of interesting data where you could, where you could get uh, your adult education classes, um, health care. The great thing about this is we walked into the uh, cabinet, uh, a cabinet meeting and put this on and the ministers passed it around and said, it's looked fine. We said, yeah, it's great, isn't it? And also it's a paper, which was good. You know, they don't have to rely on just the web to get this. This was generated off web material, but, you know, even ladies with no broadband, little old ladies with the broadband could get hold of this. We said, great, yeah, but 80% of the material in here we obtained illegally. Okay. We have broken licenses. We have not paid for stuff we should have paid for. We, could, we actually uh, harvested and scraped other data. And that kind of made them think, how could that be? Okay. So in the last couple of years, of course, lots happened in the UK. Our postcodes, for example, are freely available. Uh, most of this data is now freely available. Incredibly, the crime data is freely available at the level of the street. Some stuff still isn't. We still struggle with transport data across the UK, except in London, interestingly. So we have learnt a lot. Uh, we've actually learned that open data works at all scales. States can be active. Regions can lead the way. Cities, as in the case of London, which has actually taken an executive decision to free up its transport data, now embarrasses the rest of the country. Literally, your application stops working as you leave the boundary of London. People go, what? Why can't I see? Why, why has my app stopped working? The other thing, the dot, dot, dot refers to the fact it's not just states and regions and cities. Uh, at Southampton, uh, we have also released our data as open data. And interestingly, uh, in the context of education, we think this is a very powerful concept. Uh, and to give you an idea that this is a real concept, uh, it's always a dangerous thing to do, I know, to leave the safety of your uh, 
of your PowerPoint presentation. But if we were to go to um, Chrome here and have a look at uh, this is actually our, one of our open data uh, mashups in Southampton, and. Uh, I, this is this is a map that's provided. A student actually built much of this, and we can see a whole range of features. Um, if I want to look just near my building, the current transportation times in Southampton, um, actually I can then go and see the actual. Uh, if this is live. There's the real-time data of the bus leaving from that area. It's got a. Uh, a device, a QR code, and can put in with my mobile app. Students love this because they. We also have our timetables for uh, lectures, and they can work out just how late they need to leave their hall of residence, their bed, to get to their lecture, given the times of the trains and uh, and, and and buses. Um, but we've done more than that. We've got um, we've got our academic programs, and you may take one of these programs and look inside it. Statistics, for example, on nursing. And we're having to do this anyway. In more and more, we can see what the accessibility, the breakdown of our students are, uh, qualifications on entry, uh, all sorts of data about destination, first degree, balance, but also our student satisfaction data. Now, this is interesting. This is quite dangerous to do. You're actually saying, OK, here we are. This is what our students think of us in terms of this course. OK, but we believe that this is powerful because we believe that being transparent actually helps people make more informed choices. And in higher education in particular, we have this bizarre market in the UK where you get league tables published from sources you cannot actually access yourself with provenance that may or may not relate to you, with weightings in your league table, the Times Higher, the Times higher League table that says Southampton is whatever it is in the league table, and there's no way to get hold of that underlying data and provide an alternative view that rebalances against different weights. So I actually think that one of the drivers for data in this context is to make comparison much fairer. Anyway, that was probably longer than I intended on, on our example in Southampton, but i um, interested to, if any people is interested in following that through. So not just citizen states, but also organizations. And, and to that end, we've been developing nomenclatures, uh, we call them rather grandly ontologies, that actually describe the objects of interest in a university or an educational establishment, and they're very standard. So if we could imagine devising URIs, the technical term for the ways to refer to these things on a web of data, imagine the ability to compare and contrast our courses rather than the rigmarole we currently go through. Okay, back to data.gov.uk. It was a single portal. We develop principles that really do make the difference because they set the tone for how your officials are meant to behave. So the top principle, it's on our data.gov.uk site, that data will be published in a reusable, machine-readable format using open standards. That is a principle. And if people aren't, you can ask them the question, why? Um, to maintain the continuous flow of data. There are over 7,600 data sets on data.gov.uk now. Um, there are many more to go. This is nothing like all of them. Much of this is repeatedly generated month in and month out. Uh, but maintaining that flow is crucial. It's not just a fire and forget. That we have been trying to persuade people that there is this, what we call a, stars, um, a, a path to stardom, that even if you only have a PDF file, if you put it on the web, at least with an open license, it's better than being locked away and unavailable. Better if that was a structured format, such as a spreadsheet, even better if it's an open standard. And um, actually, if we're beginning to use web addressing to point to the key data, even better. And imagine a world in which your educational data linked to your economic data, to your welfare data, to your employment data. And that's the ultimate prize for uh, those of us who work and, and research this web of linked data. And we have seen <coughs> that as you make the data, the applications arise. So there's just a couple uh, based on, um, on, on, on crime data, for example, um, in the UK. 
uh, companies now take an increasing interest in the open data because with access to monthly crime data, they think, well, why are the premiums the same in all of these postcodes if there's so much variation? And people then say, you know, well, this is terrible. It means the price of my house will get driven down. Or actually what happens is that people get onto their local police and have a much more active engagement around why is this happening here? Is this an accurate representation of how things really are? Because this data is reported crime. An interesting question is, if you do this, will people stop reporting crime because they worry that the price of their house might go down? I've heard that argument made, but actually the evidence is very much in favour that the net benefits of this massively outweigh uh, the inaccuracies in the data or the worries about um, uh, fair presentation. Okay, um, the Open Government Licence. I cannot argue enough that this is a crucial part. The OGL, the Open Government Licence in the UK, there are three basic terms in it and one restriction. Okay. And that is, uh, there are Creative Commons variants as well. It's probably one of the most important things to take away. Uh, also, I would say there is never one single reason to convince your political masters or your reluctant officials about why you should do this. This is not an exclusive or. This does not, you know, either accountability or citizen engagement or efficiency or more economic value. Any of these arguments has real evidence behind it in the open data movement and usually what varies from state to state is the preference ranking about which one you consider at the moment to be most important or in your local context to be most interesting. You need to work top down, bottom up and middle out. You cannot just have this go as an activist driven movement. It needs political will. It needs officials in the middle who are willing to understand how to make this happen within uh, the machinery of government. It needs policies. You need to reach out to best practice, of course. And you need to release data that matters. Whilst we say you should presume to publish the data you have, if it's just dusty statistics or little regarded uh, material from the remote fringes of government, it's when it's about spending. It's when it's about crime. It's when it's about health. Those are the data sets. It's when it's about geography that matter. But having said all that, data has a long tail. Remember, the long tail thesis in the economics of the web is that out there, there are so many people who have a marginal interest in just that weird data set. And if you just take all the examples of all the people, the few groups, the small groups who have an interest in the exotic data, the cultural data, the education data, together that's a huge part, a huge number of people. Okay. So never let pure appetite and demand and quantity trump the fact we should be doing this anyway. And finally, you saw there, key one, master the data hugging excuses. You will hear every kind of reason why this is difficult. Uh, and actually, I'd, I'd refer you, if you can get hold of it, a presentation I know Andrew Stott is giving in Cambridge tomorrow, in, in Warsaw tomorrow, uh, on the data hugging excuses. It'll be, it's really very entertaining to see. Or we had this great Yes Minister TV series, Sir Humphrey. You know, the civil servant who has every reason why you don't want to do this. And uh, we've heard quite a few of them. But actually, taking them on the journey to see there's another way. Um, you've got to engage with developers. It's about applications, not just the data. So you have got to build this ecosystem where you can actually get applications built. Do not uh, worry about mistakes. You will make them. Uh, you can learn from them. Um, as I say, cultures change by changing behaviour. Uh, there's some techie stuff that I'm not sure is appropriate for this audience. We might talk about it in the, in, in, in the discussion around how you do this. But I would say that data.gov.uk was, was not an IT project. It was as much about organisational change as, as, as anything else. Um, but if you're going to launch an IT project, I would suggest that people think seriously about the opportunities that derive from using um, open source solutions. From actually, one of the big advantages from using open source systems such as Drupal and MediaWiki is that it has been hacked by every conceivable villain you can think to try and bring it down. Wikipedia, one of the most 
hacked into software platforms. So the community has made it very resilient over time. You go out and procure your particular system from supplier X, yeah, you better be sure you've done the penetration testing. That's a very expensive part of all of this, but open source often helps in that, in that case. So we often think that open source, open data, open standards go hand in hand. Of course, you don't have to buy your open source, uh, go down the open source route, but we found it helped in the UK. And finally, I'm going to end on challenges. This doesn't work without challenges. You know, where will all of this data reside? Uh, who will provide the underlying infrastructure for it? It will not always be of the quality you want. And how do you drive up quality and performance, uh, quality and, 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 and precision? And I've said very often, uh, people have heard me say, the, the great example in the UK is the bus stop data. Where are the bus stops? Well, 18,000 bus stops in the UK aren't where the government thought they were. When it published, when it published the data, and it published 360,000 data points for bus stops, 6% of them weren't where they thought they were, okay? Which is not bad. I tell you, that's a good rate of precision for most government data sets. So, before we all go, then the question is, how do we improve it? How do we engage the crowd to make our data better? There will be issues around security and privacy. How do you balance the release of information that gradually starts to identify locales and individuals? Uh, how do you have those conversations with the the, uh, the data protection people, your information commissioners of various sorts to make sure the balance is properly struck. And finally, there's a challenge to upgrade ourselves that actually in a data intensive culture where governments run on this stuff, we have to do a little bit more to educate ourselves and our uh, children and our people about the power and requirements in, uh, in data literacy. I think this is literally is a new kind of literacy that we've got to think about promoting and encouraging. So that's, that's, that's I'm sorry, I've taken a bit longer than 15 minutes, but uh, I just wanted to, to get that through. So that's my presentation. We, we just kind of rotate through now, I guess, do we? Uh, yes, splendid. I'm going to hand it over. Thank you very much. That was, yeah. that was great. Um, great introduction, very concrete. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Bas Kotterink, who is an ICT and policy consultant for TNO, which is an independent research organization in the Netherlands. Um, his expertise and research make an important contribution to the competitiveness of companies and organizations, or sorry, the organization's research and expertise makes an important contribution to the competitiveness of companies and organizations, to the economy and the quality of society as a whole. Previously, um, Mr. Kotterink worked on assignments as ICT advisor with the UK government and with multilateral organizations. His areas of interest include e-inclusion and open innovation strategies. I hope it's gonna be bigger than on the screen here. Okay, it's it's uh, it's a bit smaller than uh, than the version I had originally, but I hope uh, well, it's uh, it's it's still readable. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Bas Kotrink. Uh, I think the the apart from the general introduction, I think the the relevant work we're doing at the moment uh, that I'd like to mention is that we're doing uh, for the European uh, Commission DDG InfoSoc a project on uh, open web, and uh, in the spirit of uh, stakeholdership. Um, I, will, I don't have anything on that here, but uh, I invite everybody who's interested in open data, open web platforms to, to look at that because we want to make that an, an inclusive uh, adventure as well. And it definitely shows the interest uh, uh, in Europe in open data, open standards, and, and open web platforms. So we're very happy with that. Uh, the, the other thing Tino has done before, and I, I have to mention it, that sometimes you know, looking into the future does, does, does make sense, is that in a study in 2007 already, we had a huge uh, case study on WikiLeaks, 
And uh, we, at the time, we were just writing it, and we were really enthusiastic about how the radical disruption that it would, could cause. And then we forgot about it, you know, the, as reports end on the shelf, uh, until you know, at, at some stage, we, we opened the paper, and they said there, there was this entire case study uh, just all over the news. And so now I tend to read uh, the reports even from others a little bit more more carefully than, than before. But just uh, an, 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 an idea of the things that we uh, we are doing. Now this. Um, short uh, presentation is about a study we did for the uh, Dutch government on uh, open data drives and barriers to open government. And, and it started by the government and everybody else actually uh, noticing that open data was taking off in a, in a big time in the Netherlands. Now this is a small sample, but uh, th these are increasingly uh, looking like the, the the web-based services sheets where you have like 200 uh, initiatives that are exploding. I think it would be nice to map the increase on, in the number of initiatives uh, at the moment. Now, it's taking off everywhere else as well. And then the, the, la the, the, the last example, which is a little bit more dark example of open data, is a New York Times, uh, Times article about uh, data eye in the sky, where the government is, is uh, looking at computational social science, looking at all the data that is emerging on the web and, and seeing how they can learn and study and, and uh, um, uh, that. So th there's two sides to the open data equation, but uh, I think that's, we won't go into that, but that it is a very big item, it is, that, it is very clear. Now, the, the, all this prompted the request by the Ministry of the Interior to look uh, for TNO to do a comparative study of a number of six European countries uh, to see where they are at in impl implementing open data strategies. Now, key questions were, uh, what are the kinds of open data strategies that, that uh, countries are employing? How are they impl implemented, if they're implemented at all? Uh, what is the major influence on take up? Now, some of the, the aspects were discussed in, in I think, in Nigel's uh, presentation. So, I, some of these are clearly uh, being confirmed in this study, you'll see that. And, well, what was the impact and what are the lessons learned for the Dutch government? Um, this is a bit small, but uh, now, what is driving open government strategies in the EU? Now, there was a long list of, of, of reasons to, to, to go into open data. Um, but in the countries that we studied, the, the main objectives you know, were around uh, democracy, transparency, and accountability on the one extreme, which is very much the, the case of the, the USA, and on the other side, to improve and make uh, services provision, public services, much more effective than, than before. And especially Denmark is, is on that end of the extreme. Much less uh, is, is law enforcement, although if we look at crime statistics, et cetera, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a benefit in, in, in some areas. Um, so these are the major goals uh, for, for governments to, to be interested. Now, one of the main ways of implementing open government is actually open data. So, although there's lofty policies on transparency and, 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 and open government, and some of which are, are, are you know, believed in and are, are being addressed, but the main practical way that we see is, is by uh, having a, a concrete uh, approach to open data. And it's, 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 it's increasingly in...